We are in the midst of a several year long study through the book of Romans. We find ourselves this morning in the 12th chapter, precisely verse 10. If you would like to read along with me this very short verse, two exhortations. Paul started this chapter by calling us to be living sacrifices. Chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, it's the very essence of what it is to be a living sacrifice. Every Christian is called to this. Not just the famous ones, not just the well-known ones, not just the ones we regard as The great Christians, every child of God is called to be a living sacrifice. Two exhortations, they both come with a distinct flavor. Notice the verse, Romans 12.10, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Brethren, two exhortations. They're very simple, they're to the point. They both come with a distinct flavor. Love one another. Outdo one another. This isn't about how we treat the lost. This isn't about how we act around the unconverted family members and friends. These two words, one another, they're dead giveaway. Paul is talking about how Christians treat each other. These are two exhortations given to the church. Let me ask you a question. Some of you probably know about this. Do you know in the Roman, the the Greek Roman world in which Christianity was birthed? Do you know that? But you do know. I I, I take it you know. But many Christians were put to death. They were persecuted. Do you know what some of their crimes were? Or at least supposed crimes? Do you have any idea? What was it? Incest! That's exactly right. Can you imagine why that would have been? Did you see the song we sang? Brethren, we've met to worship. What did it say at the top of the second stanza and the third stanza? It said, sisters, brothers. You know what? They called one another brother and sister. Married men would call their wives sister. You know what was talked about in the early church? Love feasts. You had that kind of language. Listen, the apostles themselves. Listen, we Think of the two notable apostles, Paul and Peter. How did they exhort the church? You know, in our day and age, we run right past these verses. And we don't think a whole lot about them. But just listen to them. Listen to them with the ear of an unworldly, ungodly, God-hating, Christ-hating, lost world. Listen to these words. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. What? We don't give a whole lot of attention to that today. Or this one. Peter, greet one another with the kiss of love. All the talk of love and kisses and brothers and sisters. Is it any wonder that a depraved world would say, Ha! We got them here. There's incest going on in these love feasts. And so you can imagine. You know what's said about Christianity a lot of time? There's a whole lot of comments made about people and made about the churches that people don't know firsthand. They get these ideas in their mind. You can imagine a, a devil-filled, depraved world out there and, and the kind of things that would be said. Folks, one thing that we just cannot get away from is the fact that those early Christians talked this way. They did. All over the place. Our beloved brother Paul. 
Silvanus, a faithful brother. Timothy, our brother. Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved of the Lord. Aphthia, our sister. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sencrea. Peter says it this way, Love the brotherhood. Now this is interesting. Because, you know, when you come to the New Testament, so, you know what I'm, you know what I really want us to do? I want us to live lives that are influenced by the Word of God and not by tradition. And you know what? We, we talk a lot about some things that you can't find in the Bible in a, in a lot of Baptist churches, and then we miss some things that are definitely found in the Bible. We don't emphasize them. You know, you don't find, any, you don't find them referring to each other as church member Paul or that guy who goes to my church. The way the early church spoke and the way they taught and the way they believed was that to be a true follower of Jesus Christ and to belong to the church meant to be a member of the family of God. Your fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, Paul said to the Ephesians. It's a family. God is our Father. We've been given a spirit of adoption. Abba Father. Christ is our elder brother. We, by adoption, we become parts of this spiritual family. Spiritual brothers and sisters of one another. We're, fa we're family. Look, Christianity is not a religion of isolation and detached individualism. It's not about that. We're a family. There's a holy brotherhood. Jesus Christ shed His blood to bring us into this brotherhood. What Paul wants in this verse, what he's emphasizing clearly in verse 10, is that it's not an artificial deal. When we call one another brother and sister, there needs to be depth behind that language. There needs to be meaning. As the verse says, there needs to be affection. There needs to be honor. God doesn't want us using family terminology vainly. Now, have you guys ever been around people that they just they call everybody brother and sister? They're just quick to... You know, you get... I, not, not long ago, I had a guy call me. And I don't remember exactly what his name was. I'll, I'll call him Harold. Because we don't have any of those. And this guy calls me, and I, I flip the phone in Grace Community Church. Hey, this is Brother Harold. Who? I mean, it, it's... And the guy said, well, I met James and the guys down by the Alamo. I never talked to this guy before, never knew him from any place before. I, I knew nothing about the guy. No idea at all. But he's Brother Harold. And it's, now look, the thing about that is, people can use this terminology, this family terminology, in a way that's, that's awkward, that's petty, that's overly casual. But you know, in the early church, it wasn't that way. I mean, in the early church, it was a guarded family. You know, oftentimes when, when like today, we have folks from Owensboro, and we have folks from Brownsville, and you know, there was a day when... When people traveled, they would bring letters. Hey, this is a brother. This is a sister. I mean, it wasn't a cheap deal. It wasn't something people just threw around. We've got people all over this country claim to be Christians. Many are going to say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, folks, we've got people running all over the place. They use this kind of terminology. And what Paul's saying right here is to be in this family and to call one another brother and sister. It's not to be a casual thing. It's not to be a vain thing. It's not just to be a surface thing, a fluffy thing, a light thing. It's to be deep. There's to be depth to this family relationship. So here it is. We have two distinct exhortations in this verse. Both have to do with our attitudes and our actions towards one another within the family of God. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. My task this morning is just to consider what the meaning is of both these exhortations. We'll look at the first part first. We'll look at the second part last. Here it is. Love one another with brotherly affection. Well, what is that? Love one another with brotherly affection. Literally, the term for love is Philadelphia. So it's brotherly love. This could literally read this way, in brotherly love, 
to one another, be family affectionate. Or Lloyd-Jones says it might read, in brotherly love to one another, loving warmly. I mean, you, you get the idea of what's being said. There's no place for saying, well, I'm just going to love that guy over there, but I don't really like him. And sometimes we get like that in the church. You know, there's a certain brother, yeah, I know I'm supposed to love him, but I don't, I don't much like being around him. There's no place for saying, well, I'm going to go to the same church, but I don't really know that person and I don't really care to get to know them. There's, there's no place for that. You can't do that. Our love, it, it's, look, as the church grows, now I realize, sometimes when people first come in and when they come in at, at a rate that you're like, who's that? I don't even know that person yet. I haven't had an opportunity. M Matt was just telling me the other day, we, at one point we had some people baptized and he's like, I don't even know their name. Well, look, I can understand right in the beginning, but you cannot do that. This verse will not let us say, well, there's that person over there. You know, my paths don't cross. It seems like on Sunday morning, I kind of go over to this corner. They go to that corner. I don't know them. Never been to their house. They've never been to mine. It's just the way it is. We're going to be distant. We're going to be extended here. That's not what Paul's calling for. You can't be affectionate with a person if you just made up in your mind, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to live that way. I'm going to accept it. They're going to be distant. We're going to be far apart. When people join this church, when people are coming in here, we've got, if you're going to be affectionate, you've got to get in their lives. You've got to get to know them. You've got to come alongside them. That's, that's basically what's being said here. Our love for one another must be truly tender, affectionate, kind, warmly devoted to one another, loving one another tenderly. You remember how Peter puts it? He speaks about brotherly love. And he says, love one another fervently. What a word! Fervently or earnestly love the brethren. That's what our... You don't love somebody firm fervently and affectionately if you've kind of determined, well, I've got my inner cloister. I'm going to hang with this little group. And people outside that, well, I just don't want anything. You know what? That guy over there, he's not interested in the same things I am. He's not interested in outreach where I'm interested in. And so, and you, that's not what Paul's saying here. You, that's not the way to go. The church needs to be close. It needs to be loving. It needs to be affectionate. Here it is. I dug this up, and I actually was prompted to do this by something that Matt gave to my kids the other day. I got online and I began to research this, and it just tremendously, I thought, fit this. Let me tell you, there was a day, let me tell you what date, it was the 6th of March in the year 2000, or 2000, 203. The place, imagine, you're in the city of Carthage, it's during the Roman Empire, Year 203, you've got a dungeon. This is in the north of Africa, right along the Mediterranean coast. You've got three men, two women. They both sit down to a meal. It's their last supper. Seems the Roman custom was to give the condemned a last meal of their choice. You know what those five used that meal for? They used it to hold a love feast. That's what history tells us. These events, by the way, were recorded by one of the five women at that table. The rest of the story, and you'll realize there's a place where she couldn't have kept recording it, it was recorded and preserved by others. You know what? It was during the time of the Roman Emperor Septimius Severus, and these five were convicted of being Christians. You know what they wouldn't do? They would not take a little bit of incense and throw it on the fire and recognize the emperor, the Caesar, as God. They wouldn't do it. They said, we're Christians. We're not doing it. They were sentenced to death. There was an arena there in Carthage. The sentence was execution, the manner of death. Guess what they were going to face in there? Wild animals. So reads the account. Now dawned the day, the next day, the 7th of March, the day of their victory, they went forth from the prison into the amphitheater as if it were into heaven. Now imagine these five. You've got three men and two women. They went into that amphitheater not terrified, not screaming, not all up in arms. They were cheerful. They were bright of countenance. If they trembled at all, it was for the joy, not for fear. 
five of them. Two ladies were called by the names of Perpetua and Felicity. The three men were Revoticus, Saturus, and Saturninus. As the men walked first, it said Perpetua followed behind, glorious of presence, as a spouse of Christ, darling of God, at whose piercing look the people in the stands could not continue to gaze upon her. Felicity likewise rejoicing. You know why she was rejoicing? She was in prison, she was pregnant, and it was against Roman law to throw a woman who was pregnant out into the arena. And she didn't want to... She didn't want to miss going with her brethren. And God gave her to give birth in the eighth month. She gave birth there. They gave the child off to some other Christian some way when people were permitted to come in there. And she was rejoicing that she would be able to die with her brethren. She'd borne a child just days before in the prison. She might now fight with the beast. She came now from blood of birth to blood of battle, from the midwife to the gladiator, to wash after her travail in a second baptism. And now they're at the gate. Perpetua began to sing. When they came into the procurator, Hilarion's sight, he's up there in that high seat overlooking this amphitheater. They began to say to Hilarion, stretching forth their hands, You judge us, they said, and God judges you. And at that, the crowd was infuriated. And there was a line of gladiators right there. And they demanded, the crowd demanded that they be scourged. They began to scourge the five of them, and the five of them were rejoicing. They were smiling and they were praising that they were counted worthy to suffer with their Master. Then, after the scourging, Revoticus fought with a leopard, and then he was ripped open by a bear. Satyrus was tied to a boar by a gladiator. The gladiator who did the binding was torn asunder by the beast and died several days later. Satyrus was dragged around by the boar. Then Satyrus was tied to a bridge to be eaten by a bear, but the bear wouldn't come out of the den. For the women, the devil had made ready a most savage cow, prepared for this purpose against all custom. For even in this beast, the devil would mock their sex. Perpetua was the first to be thrown on the sharp horns. She fell upon her loins. When she sat upright, she was more concerned about her ripped robe than the wounds to her body. She drew it over to cover her thigh, mindful rather of modesty than pain. And then she found a pin and she tied her hair back. She felt that it was wrong for a martyr of the Lord to have disheveled hair. For it was not fitting that a martyr should suffer with hair like that, lest she should seem to grieve in her glory. So she stood up, and when she saw Felicity smitten down by the cow, she went up. Now, this is where I really want you to tune in. She went up and she gave her hand. Here's this... Imagine, you're in the midst of this savage steer. This thing has been raised to kill and mutilate with its horns. It's going around, it's sharp, it's tossing these ladies around. And instead of trying to defend herself, she walks over, she helps her sister up. Perpetua called to the others, saying, Stand fast in the faith. And listen to what she exhorts them right there on the floor of the amphitheater. Love one another. Be not offended because of our passion. At this point, a leopard was released with one bite. Satyrus was covered with so much blood that the people cried out to him, well washed, well washed. Then as the breath of him was cast down, or as his breath left him, he was cast down with the rest of the Christians into the accustomed place where their throats would be cut. But the crowd wasn't satisfied with that. They said, because it was down in some hole or something, and they said, no, bring the Christians where we can see them. We want to see the slaughter. We want to see you drive the sword into them. Now the Christians heard this. And you know what they did? They rose of themselves to walk by their own strength to where they could actually be seen by the crowd to be slaughtered there. But before they walked, they all huddled together and they kissed one another. Then they went there bidden. They went to where they were bidden. They went there like sheep to the slaughter. And one after another, their throats were cut. And they went to be with the Lord. Brethren, they kissed one another. 
Can you imagine that sight? Can you imagine the affection? Can you imagine the tenderness of that? You know, we, we walk in the door and we get around people. We get offended with one another. We've been bought by the same blood. We're in a family that's going to go through endless ages. And you know what? They kissed one another. Oh, we can jump all over. Well, we, you know, we're against that foot washing stuff. That's legalism. And we're against these, these kisses of love because it's not appropriate culturally. You know what? Maybe we ought to break the culture. God's people are supposed to be affectionate. And there is no doubt there is a lack of affection in the churches today, brethren. There is a lack. They kissed one another. And you know, I realize in the church there are some that are more likable than others. That's, that's true. You, you come into the church and you say, I know he's a professing Christian and he's likely a Christian, but, but the guy just annoys me. He's strange. And that girl is just socially backward. Did you never hear God saves sinners? I mean, sinners are strange. They're backward folks. But that's exactly who the living Christ fills His church with. And oftentimes, they are backward people. They are strange people. They are unlikable people by nature. That's just the very nature of the type of people. Perpetua. She was high born. She came from a rich family. Felicity was a slave. And yet there, they kissed one another. Why? They're in the, spiritually, they're in the same family. All the barriers are broke down. You say, I don't like that guy's color. I don't like where they came from. I don't like the way they dress. I don't like where part of the city they live in. Look, Christianity breaks all this down. We become members of a family that goes beyond all the associations of this world. Whether you're high born, low born, whether you're from the east side, west side, south side, north side. Folks, this is the kind of life that brings us to where there is a love all the things in this world aside, to a closeness that goes beyond earthly families. We are to have a tenderness here. Through all of our peculiarities, through all of our backwardness, we are to love one another in a way that is strangely and affectionately foreign to this world out here. We're called to that. You know what? We're not naturally disposed to this. But you know what it's been said? With God all things are possible. We need to be praying for this. We need to pray, be pressing forward with this. We need to pray God would give us brotherly love, tender affection. Beloved, Jesus Christ said, by this, people will know that you are my disciples. By what? By the fact that we go and evangelize all aggressively, the fact that we go out into the poor parts of the city, and the fact that we go down to the Alamo, and the fact that we go to the campuses, and the fact that we like to send forth missionaries. Is that what he said? By that the world's going to know you're to my disciples? And by the fact that we all have our Bibles open, we meet at fatties, and we all got them all open, and we come to listen to the preaching, we like to listen to Paul Washer on the, the internet. Is that why? Is that how they're going to know that, that we belong to him? Is that how we're going to know we're his disciples? Folks, it's not that. It's not, well, you know, they're going to know because we meet here on Wednesday nights to pray and we leave the shutters open. People can drive by and see us. Oh yeah, they must be Christians. That's not what Christ said. Christ said that the world's going to know if you have love for one another. One of the most profound comments made regarding the early church came from the lips of a man, and maybe you've heard this before, named Aristides, sent by the emperor to spy out the strange creatures known as Christians. Having seen them in action, Aristides returned with his report. But his immortal words to the emperor have echoed down through history, and here's what they are. Behold how they love one another. Maybe you've heard that before. Brethren, by this, the people of this world are going to know that we are His disciples. If you have love, one for another. Does this matter? And folks, does this matter to you? Should it matter? I mean, I ask myself that question. By this, the world's going to know. Okay, but does it matter if the world knows? Well, we might say, well, it ought, it ought to matter because obviously God 
commands it. That's a, that's a reason why it should matter. It ought to matter too because you know what we go around telling people? We tell people Christ is able to save you from your sins. Not only from the damnation of it, not only from the penalty of it. Don't we like to tell people? Don't we tell people? Isn't that one of the great indications a person's a true Christian? By the very power that is unleashed through the Gospel into people's lives? I and mean, one of the ways that we're going to show the world that our gospel really has the power that we say it has is by our love to one another. Because by nature, men are not loving. Men are hateful. Men are spiteful. Men are jealous. Men are envious. Men are out for themselves. They are self-centered. They are self-absorbed. And that is totally the opposite of love. And if we're really going to go around and tell this world that we have a gospel that will change the world, we need to have lives that speak to the power. There's no question about it, folks. The world's looking. Well, let me tell you something. I tell you, somebody who was watching the kiss in that amphitheater that day, there was a Roman soldier who was out there on the amphitheater grounds and saw the execution of those five. You know what else he did? He ran the jail there. His name was Pudens. Guess what? History tells us he saw this and he was converted. Let me tell you something else. This Arrestides guy, he observed the Christians. History tells us he was converted. Now you say, is there any power in that? I'll tell you that. I've heard people say before that the power is in the Gospel. It's not in our lives. I'll tell you what, that's not what the Scripture says. It says it's in both. Yes, the Gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and we've got to have our truth, and we've got to have it right, we've got to have it straight, we've got to be people absorbed with doctrine, we've got to know our Bibles, the truth sets men free. But I'll tell you what, you're never going to become a vessel fit for the Master's use unless these things are true of your life. You can become very impotent and very powerless very quickly, even when you've got a truth in your hand that's meant to be powerful. You, by your life, can make it impotent. And that, folks, I'm not, I'm not inventing that. There are ways that we make ourselves fit for the Master's use. There are ways. Many of you have heard about that missionary over in the Far East. You know, they waltzed in there. What'd they do? They waltzed in there and they preached the Gospel. They sought to train men. They sought to plant churches. And yet, He will be the first to testify that they did not see major moves of the Gospel until there was large evidences of Christian love manifest in that place. I'm telling you, you want to unleash the power of the Gospel? It does matter. It matters what the world sees. They see, look, behold how they love one another. Do the people, lost people that come into this place, is that what they leave with? Or do they say, behold, how they criticize one another, how they backbite one another. Behold, how pitifully, you know, you got a lost employer, you work with lost employees, are they saying, behold, what a sorry sluggard that guy is. Man, he's the most pathetic guy in the place. His work is pitiful. You got family members, they're saying, that guy claims to be a Christian. He's one of the worst dads I know. They're fighting all the time. Behold! Behold these Christians. Behold what hypocrites they are. Brethren, we don't want that being said. We don't want that being said. We don't want the world looking on and saying, Behold! Behold how they fight. Behold how they wrangle with each other. Behold their jealousy. Behold their envy. Behold! They say they believe in this Christ, but behold how little they really show they love Him. Behold how little they love each other. Behold, brethren, God forbid. God help us. May the world know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. May they say, behold, there is an affection those people have. There's a tenderness. They're willing to sacrifice. They're warm towards one another in the way that is not known out there in the world. Let that help attract people, folks, to our Gospel. And I'll tell you what, it does have a power about it. You show me mean, cold-hearted people who have all the orthodoxy down, and I'll show you a place where God isn't using the folks very much. And you know what? 
You show me a place where maybe they don't have all their doctrine tweaked just right, but they have love. You take those people that know a thousand times more, and you may find the people who know a thousand times less being used a thousand times more. It's been that way in history, folks. It's not always those that have known the most. It's always been those that have loved the most. Now look, we need to love each other based on truth. You're never going to know what love is aside from truth. What is it to love? I mean, you, you've got to be able to define that. What is good? We, we read about that early in Romans 12. You want, to, you want to lay hold on what's good. You want to abhor what's evil. You're never going to know that unless you know your Bibles. It's the Bible that tells us what's good, what's bad. It's the Bible that tells us what love is. It's not just some fluffy, fuzzy feeling. Love, if we're truly going to love people, we've got to be able to communicate a gospel to them that, we, that is clearly presented, that is based on truth. It's got to be a message that God's going to use to save people. Let's go to the second part. The second part of the verse says, outdo one another in showing honor. Now look, let me tell you right off. Think about this. I am to outdo you in showing honor. Well, obviously, I'm to outdo you in showing honor to you. It's not try to outdo you in showing honor to myself. We're to outdo one another in showing honor Remember, this is a something, the, the first part of this, our affection, our love, our brotherly love. This, this idea rings with this brotherly love idea. It's how I treat you and what honor I bestow upon you. And I am seek to outdo the honor I bestow upon you over and above the honor you bestow upon me. They're supposed to, I mean, Paul's virtually saying compete here. This is a good competition. You want to try to outrun one another? Do it right here. Try to outrun one another showing honor. Now look, Paul's not saying abandon truth, abandon discernment. He's not basically saying just throw out the window every spiritual judgment. You follow what I'm saying? Basically, he isn't saying that I need to be falsely modest and say, you know, it's not like if we're in the church and it's apparent that God's given this brother a gift of faith, and this brother doesn't have a gift of faith. And this brother says, Oh, you have the gift of faith. When he doesn't have it, this one says, You know, well, thank you. And they're, they're just trying to outdo one another in saying that, and it's not true. It's not like if, some guy, if, if one of the brothers comes up here and preaches, and he does absolutely terrible, and he's preaching that which isn't true, and we all come up and we're saying, Well, we're going to outdo one another in showing honor, so I'm going to be the first one up there and tell him how great it is. That's not the kind of thing. It's not the kind of thing where it, there's this false modesty where you're just deferring and saying, oh no, I don't really have that gift, you do. When in fact you do have that gift, and they don't. And you see where I'm coming from? This, this is not what this is all about. Paul, the Apostle Paul, think about what he could do. What did he do? He could call people to follow him. Did he not? He put himself up as an example. Now, if... if Really, outdoing one another in honor had to do with that false humility stuff. What he would have said is, oh no, I'm not worthy to be followed. You're worthy to be followed. But he didn't do that. Basically, look, where there's humility, where there's true humility and a true desire to honor one another, you can be truthful and you can acknowledge where gifts are. You can examine things properly. You can make statements like that. You can call people to follow you. Honoring others doesn't conflict with that. It's not opposed to that. If you're a good example to be followed, call other people to follow your example. Don't think that that's, oh, I've got to be overly modest and I can't do that. That's, that's not right. You see where I'm coming from? The idea here is, is, a, is different than that. What's he exhorting us to do? Look, you guys... You know that it's possible. That, now just think with me here. You can honor somebody who is dishonorable. Can you not? Now think about it. If the President of the United States came and he's a dishonorable guy. We've had presidents, have we not, that have been adulterers? They've been liars? And have we had any president that didn't tell lies? 
in our day, anyway, in, in the time when any of us have been alive? I mean, is that honorable? It's not honorable. In and of themselves, we've had some scoundrels that have been president. But you can still honor them, can you not? And what would honor look like? Well, you know, you'd pick them up in a limo and you give them the best food and you give them nice places to sleep. You basically treat them in the way that would be an expression of honor. Now look, it's not as though the Bible's foreign to this concept. Let's, let, let me just throw out a couple. Likewise, husbands, 1 Peter 3, 7, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor. Okay, well let me tell you this. Are some wives bad wives? You know what the proverb said. It's better to live in the corner of the housetop than with who? A quarrelsome woman. You think there's some quarrelsome women out there? I mean, even before the grace of God so so deeply affects a true converted lady, do you think some of them have a tendency to be quarrelsome? And you know what? Definitely. Husbands, we got any quarrelsome wives? But here's the thing. Peter didn't say, well, if, if they're honorable, honor them. He said, no, honor them because of the place they have. We, get, we find this kind of talk in the Scriptures. How about 1 Peter 2.17? Honor the emperor. Whoa, who were some of the emperors? Caligula? Trajan? Nero? You think these were honorable guys? You think Nero was honorable when he would basically stick a pole through Christians and cover them with tar and light them on fire? Is that pretty honorable? And yet, were they to be honored? Absolutely. Got the same kind of idea goes through the Scripture. 1 Timothy 6.1 Let all who are under a yoke as slaves regard their masters as worthy of all honor. You think all slave owners have been honorable? And yet the slaves are called to honor them. You know, we have this idea in 1 Corinthians 12.23 Those parts of the body that we think less honorable were to bestow greater honor. Look, it's possible to take those in the church and bestow the greater honor on them even if they seem less honorable. How? Not simply by saying, you know, you can do something you can't do. Not by saying, I think you've got gifts you don't have. Not by saying anything that's untrue, but by treating them in a way that shows great respect, that shows great honor. That Look, let me, let me throw some. If John MacArthur or John Piper, whichever, you know, if you guys like these guys, imagine... Somehow, some way, they found themselves down here to San Antonio. We were able to get them to come to the church here, and circumstances just fell out where they had to come to your house and spend the night. How would you treat them? Would you kick them off into some, you know, make them sleep on the floor? Push them off in some back room that you hadn't swept in, in a whole lot of time? There's, you know, raw, half eaten dog food all over the floor back there, and it's flea infested because you kept the dog in there, and there's fleas on the wall, and. You know, basically throw an old blanket that you were able to pick up off the street somewhere back there and say, well, here, John. You, would, you laugh and you wouldn't do that. But listen to me. When it says to outdo one another in honor, what do you think this means? This means treat each other maybe even like you would treat Christ if He came to your house. Do you remember something? Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it to me. Oh, is there not incentive? You say, I don't really like that guy. That guy's strange. That guy's a misfit. That guy's socially backward. You know, we've had run-ins over doctrine. We've had run-ins over this. You know, it just seems like, you know what? As much as you love them, as much as you show honor to them, you do it unto Christ. You know, what's, you know what's interesting? Scripture comes along and says things like this. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, who is he persecuting? The brethren. You find it said in what? 1 Corinthians 8? You find that if you sin against a brother, you sin against Christ. In other words, you start dishonoring one of the brothers, you sin against Christ. And as much as you honor one of the brothers, you do it to Christ. How much would you honor Christ? Let it, put John MacArthur, John Piper, the President of the United States, put them out of the window here. Bring Christ in. Look! 
You're, you're living in this church right now, and you're able to come in. There's somebody's joined the church. You don't care to cross paths. You don't go out of your way to make it a point to try to love them, to try to be affectionate, to try to show them honor. How do you show honor? If somebody comes in, you serve them, right? You show honor by serving people. Serve one another in love, Paul told the Galatians. How? Hey, let me tell you something. You know what one of the dangers is when we travel overseas? That the Christians in those countries, in seeking to honor us, are going to do things that we really would not have them do. You know what they'll do sometimes? They will serve you a meal that costs them a month's wage. Why? Because they want to honor you. Is there not honor in service? I'll tell you this, if Jesus Christ came through the doors, any of you going to be hanging off back over there? Any of you not interested to get involved in His life? Any of you interested not to come try to serve Him? See what you can do for Him? Try to get close to Him? Try to be affectionate to Him? Try to show Him honor? You would all flock right there. And as much as you do it to one of the least of His, you do it unto Him. Folks, let me tell you something. One of the ways you honor people is by the sacrifices you're willing to make to them, the service you're willing to lay down for them, the gifts you're willing... You know, when we've gone to other places in the world, they like to bring you blankets... They like to bring you Bibles. They like to bring you machetes. Anything that they have in their society that they think is a token of esteem and love and honor, they love to bestow it upon you. That's how we're supposed to be one to another. There's no place for ignoring. Folks, you, you know what? What's, what's one of the greatest ways you can serve another? Is there anything greater than laying down your life for the brothers? Does not John call us to that very thing? You want to show love? Lay down your life for your brothers. Sacrifice for your brothers. Give it up. Are you willing to do that? Did you come to Christ? Are you in this church? Are you living with that mindset that I am supposed to go all the way to laying down? That's, that's the greatest honor. The greatest honor you can give somebody is to give them their all. Give them your all. To lay it all down. You say, well yeah, I do. Oh yeah? You'll give your life for them, but you won't walk across the room to get to know them? Look, don't tell me, well, I'll lay down my life for them, but I won't invite them over to my house because their kids are unruly and they're likely to mess some of my stuff up. Don't tell me you're willing to lay down your life for them, but you won't sit down at the same table and have lunch with them. Don't tell me you'll lay down the life for them, but you wouldn't have them in your house. You won't go to their house. You won't be involved in them. You'll let them sit back in some corner. You'll let them be detached. That's not outdoing one another and showing honor, folks. If there's reasons that you're keeping yourself distant from somebody in this church, repent of it now. Because you are not living up to this verse if that's the case. Listen, don't tell me, I lay down my life for them, but I won't associate with them. Listen, disassociation is church discipline, not church love. That's what we do when we want to put somebody out of the church. We say, we're going to disassociate. Brethren, brotherly affection. Outdo one another's in showing honor. And folks, it, it's not like we don't have an example. I mean, think about it. I, th I thought about World War II. You've got those kamikazes. What were they willing to do? They were willing to honor the emperor. And how would they do it? They were willing to honor the emperor by laying down their lives. You've heard of soldiers and you've heard of knights who are willing to honor their leader would lay down their lives. But have you ever heard... Hello, guys. Have you ever heard of a king to lay down his life? To show such honor? You think about it. Think, think with me, folks. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know what the truth is? This guy's not a king. Not in this world. He's not royalty. Not in this world. He's not in a high place in office. But you know what? Can I treat him like a king? Yep. And how are, how are kings treated? Well, they're served. I mean, Jesus Christ said, look, if you've got a servant, he's out working in the field, he comes in, you don't tell him to sit down at the table with you, what do you tell him to do? 
You tell him to get over there and make the food. And after he's done all that for you, then he can take care of himself. See, that's, what, that's how honor is shown to masters. The servant takes care of them. That's how you show honor. You basically serve. You give yourself. Let me tell you something. Even the least Christian in this room, if you think about it, they are royalty. They are people of whom this world is not worthy. They are people who are peculiar people, a special people for His own possession. They are children of God. They belong in the family. God is their God, and Christ shed His blood for them. They are royalty. They may not look like it right here. I know they give you that another incentive. But, folks, think about how Christ honored us. Did you, did you guys even grasp what was sung in that first song? the very last stanza, Christ is going to gird Himself and He's going to serve us. You know that comes from the Scriptures? You know Luke tells us about that? Christ is going to gird Himself and serve us. Did you ever read that Jesus Christ did not come to be served, but to serve and to give Himself a ransom for many? Listen, when it's, it's unheard of that a king would serve his subjects. That doesn't happen. Not in this world. Kings are served. Masters are served. Masters don't serve slaves. Kings don't serve subjects. And yet the King of Kings, have you ever, have you ever contemplated what He did? He became a curse for us. I mean, He gave Himself. The, the fact is, there's no greater expression of love than what? You lay down your life for a friend. And you know what? There's no greater expression of honor than to say, brother, sister, I love you. I will serve you. I will serve you to the death. I will die in your place. I will lay down my life that you might live. There's no greater expression. And Christ is the example and we're called to follow it. We're called to do the exact same thing. Brethren, He became a curse for us. That's not, a, that's not a light matter. That's no small thing. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Brethren, Jesus Christ laid down His life. He didn't just feel forsaken on that cross. He was forsaken. There are churches... I can remember talking to Charles. He told me about going into a church one time. Charles and Stormy, he used to be an elder here. They're, they're black. They went into a church and they weren't welcome there because they were black. I think Matt was talking about a church where somebody wasn't welcome because they stunk. You know what Christ calls us to do? Lay down a life for one another. I can't endure somebody's smell or somebody's skin color. If you can't do that, you're so far away. Jesus Christ is our example. Brethren, are we following that example? Look, we're getting people in here from a number of different churches and a number of different backgrounds. And a lot of what you've heard, a lot of what you've been taught, a lot of what you've been subject to is not biblical Christianity. It's garbage, it's cheap, it's light, it's fluff. This is what we're being called to. Folks, Christ is our example. You've never heard of a king laying down his life for his subjects. And the king of kings laid down His life for His enemies. Nobody has done anyone in all of history a greater honor than Jesus Christ did for His people. 
And we are to seek to outdo one another in showing honor. Brethren, if we were there, if it came our turn to die, let me, let me just finish with this. That kiss that those five martyrs exchanged in the amphitheater that day, that had roots. That went back to a relationship the five of them had in prior days. It wasn't like, oh no, we're going to die, we better kiss. That kiss of love came from a life of love, I guarantee. It came from a way they served one another and loved one another before they were captured. Brethren, if we were all thrown in the amphitheater, would we be able to kiss one another like that? based on a life that we had lived like that, a life of closeness, endearment. You know what, church? You say, I'm too prim and proper. I'm, I'm, I'm just not like this. I don't know if you kiss each other. I can tell you, I go into Romania, and you know, the, the gypsies will walk up to you, and you know, they plant one on both sides of the face, and it's kind of like, whoa, we're Americans. Yeah, but you know what? We're Christians first. And we need to show expressions of love. And we need to hug each other. We need to call one another brother and sister. We don't want to use it cheaply. And when we call one another that, we need to mean it by our lives and by our sacrifice and by our love, by our willing to seek to outdo one another in honor, by our affection, by our willing to serve one another. Brethren, I know by nature... But we don't believe we're in here by nature. We believe that we're in here with the Spirit of God and that the living Christ walks in the midst of His church and that we can ask Him, Lord, give us this affection. Give us this honor for one another. Help us in some little way just to imitate the honor and the affection that You had and showed for Your people and still have and still show. Can you imagine it, folks? We enter in to glory. There He is, high and lifted up, such sight as none of us have ever imagined. We are overwhelmed by the beauty and the glory, the holiness. Immediately as we behold Him, we are being transformed into something incomprehensible. His glory, His beauty stagger us. We fall on our faces. And He, the King of kings, the Lord in all of His magnificence, girds Himself and says, My bride, now I serve you. What? What is this you're doing? That's what He came to this earth to do. Not to be served, but to serve. And he says, my brothers and sisters, imitate me. Follow me. Learn of me. And live that way yourselves. May God help us to do so. Amen. You're dismissed.